Good morning. Is this on? Okay. Well, here we go. As we get started, um, as before we jump into Romans chapter one, I want to show you a few pictures um, from the internet. These are screen captures that I created, and I want you to see these people. And we're going to talk a little bit about social media for a second. So I want you to see um, these pictures. Does, does anybody know who this is? Okay, so I want you to notice that on her Twitter page, does, does everybody use Twitter? I don't use Twitter. Do you use Twitter? No? Okay, maybe this is not for this crowd. Sorry. Um, she introduces herself as a human. So as she, as she puts her face forward to the whole world, she wants everybody to know that she's a human. And then this article, I, I looked, he doesn't have social media, but... Um, this article describes him as the greatest pool player in the whole world of all time. Um, so that's how he is known in the world. And this person is from my country, and he's known as someone who runs in movies. That's how he wants to be known in the world. <clears throat> now, Paul, of the New Testament, I just switched from today to the Bible. I just switched. So Paul in the New Testament, didn't have social media. That This is a new thing, right? And so Paul used the greatest technology of his day to communicate to as many people as he possibly could. And the greatest technology of his day was letters. Handwritten, hand-copied letters that he wrote and sent to, the, to everybody that he could. And so Paul we, writes, now it's stuck. We don't need to be stuck here. Okay. So Paul writes letters to the churches, and this um, is the beginning of a series on a study of the book of Romans, which is a letter to the church in Rome. <clears throat> and these verses today, verses 1 through 4, are how Paul introduces himself. If Paul were alive today, this would be his Twitter bio. This would be what he would say about himself, that he would want the whole world to know John just caught up. <laughs> Okay, this is what he would want everybody to know about himself. And so as, as we begin, I want us to look at what Paul says about himself. And I want us to answer three questions today. These are our three questions. What is your identity? What is the gospel and who is Jesus? And these are things that Paul touches on right here in these verses. Who is Paul? We're going to look at Paul's identity. What is the gospel and who is Jesus? And this is just the beginning. I'm not going to spoil the rest of Romans. I'm going to try not to. Um, but we're going to talk about how Paul starts off his letter today and answers these three questions. So we're going to start with identity. And we're going to start with how Paul identifies himself. If it'll go. Okay. So... Paul starts out and says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. First thing that Paul wants us to know about himself is that he is a servant. It's the same word for slave, right? And this, this is not how most people introduce themselves. Hi, I'm a slave. I'm a servant. We don't start like that, but Paul did. He started as a servant. And slavery in this day, in Paul's day, whether voluntary or involuntary, was sort of ownership. You didn't get to direct your life. You didn't get to decide what you were going to do. You did what your master told you. And so Paul is saying here that he is a servant, but not just a servant of anybody. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. So this is a very unique position because you want to be a servant of the greatest master, you want to be a servant of the best, most kind, most generous, most loving master. And so Paul puts himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior, the one who has the power over sin and death. So Paul puts himself as a slave. And that's a wonderful place for Paul to be, right? Second thing Paul uses to describe himself is the word apostle. Paul says, I am an apostle. Now, you probably know from Acts chapter 9, right, that um, Paul used to not believe in Jesus. He was a Jewish teacher, and he was actually persecuting Jesus' church. And so Paul was going from Jerusalem to a city called Damascus, and then there was this bright light, and Paul was blinded, and Jesus showed up and talked to Paul. The incarnate risen Christ showed up and had a conversation with Paul and changed Paul's life completely, turned him around and sent him the other direction. He said, 
Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. That's how Paul was described. Right? So Paul is an apostle. Now, apostles in the New Testament are eyewitnesses, people who actually saw Jesus. So the 12 disciples and and Paul here are all considered the apostles. But other people don't get that title of apostle. Other people get a different title. Here um, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing, and he says, and as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches. He uses a different title of messenger for other Christians. The same thing in Philippians. He describes Epaphrodites as a messenger from the church to minister to Paul's needs. So we have this other title for people who maybe didn't see Jesus face to face, weren't walking with him while he was alive. They get the title of messenger. So Paul is an apostle. Other Christians are messengers. And that would include us, Christians in the room. If you are a Christian, you can also... You also have the responsibility of being a messenger, carrying the good news of Jesus, right? So, an apostle is how Paul describes himself. And then we get one more. Paul, a servant and an apostle. And then he describes himself as set apart. He is set apart. So Paul has been picked out and given a unique task. We saw that in in Acts chapter 9, that he is supposed to be... um, a a message bearer, a gospel sharer among the Gentiles, right? So that is his ministry. You've probably read through Acts and read some of Paul's letters. You know that he went around to different cities and different places sharing the gospel and starting churches. That's what he was set apart for. All right, so we see Paul describing himself. Paul is a servant, an apostle, and Paul is set apart apart. Let's go on to our second question, because Paul is set apart not just for anything, but for the gospel, right? So we see um, Paul is set apart for the gospel, and let's talk about how he describes the gospel. In verse 2, we see that the gospel is described as a promise, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, we know the Holy Scriptures for Paul and the first generation of churches were the Old Testament. This is the Jewish scriptures, Genesis through Malachi, the Old Testament. These are the prophets and the scriptures that Paul is talking about. There were promises made in these scriptures of a Messiah to come, and Paul is saying that his gospel is a fulfillment of those promises, right? So far this year, we've been studying through Genesis. You remember? Okay, I'm just making sure you're with me. Um, So we've been studying through Genesis, and even in Genesis, after the fall, when when Jesus is, is punishing Adam and Eve and the serpent, he says of Eve, there's going to be an offspring from Eve who's going to crush the serpent's head, who's going to bring deliverance for God's people. This is the first prophecy about the Messiah. And you can look through the stories of Noah and Abraham and Moses and King David and all the prophets, and we see these promises about a coming Messiah who will come and bring salvation to God's people. So this is a part of the gospel, that it was promised beforehand. And it's also described as concerning God's Son. So this gospel is promised, and this gospel is about the Son of God. It is a promise about the Son of God. So the gospel, the fulfillment of promises, and it's fulfilled by Jesus. That's how Paul wants us to understand the gospel right here in the beginning. Here's a simple definition. I don't want to spoil the rest of our study in Romans because really Paul is going to go, if we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter through Romans, this whole book is an exposition, is a teaching on the gospel. But I wanted to give us a very simple definition this morning, something that's memorable that we can hold on to as we go this week. And this came from Tim Keller in a book he wrote about marriage, actually. But it's a, it's a definition of the gospel that, that really has encouraged me in the last few weeks. So he says this, the gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. I just want to encourage you to hold both sides of that gospel definition together. That you are, you and I, we are sinners. 
and we are condemned and we have more sin and more offense to God in our lives than we even know about. He is more offended at the life that we're living than we can possibly imagine. But if we stop there, we get stuck in a works-based religion. If I stop there, all you hear is work harder and do more. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is not work harder and do more. The gospel is the grace of Jesus Christ because just like you're a sinner, more, you have more sin than you could possibly imagine. You are also more loved and accepted than you could ever dare hope for. He loves you. And he accepts you with open arms, bleeding hands, bleeding head. On the cross, you are accepted in Jesus Christ. And you are loved more than you can possibly imagine. And you might think, yeah, but Micah, you don't know me. Or you might think nobody knows what I've done. He knows, and he is willing to forgive and accept you no matter what. And you have to hold both sides of that. If we get, get rid of the sin side because we think, I don't want to talk about sin, and we just want to talk about love and acceptance, we have what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls easy believism, uh, cheap grace, right? It's cheap. There's no cost to it. There's no reason for Jesus to die if everybody's just accepted. So we have to have the sin side. We have to know that we desperately need a savior. And yet at the same time, we have to believe, please believe that Jesus loves you deeply and cares for you deeply. Okay, that's the gospel, how Paul begins his teaching on the gospel, right? Now let's talk about this. We see in Romans, right, that this gospel <clears throat> concerns the Son of God, concerning God's Son, who was what? Let's talk about who this son is. Two characteristics of Jesus here in these verses. First, Jesus is described as descended from David. Now, for us today, this might not be a big deal that Jesus is from David. But if your Bible, if your scriptures are the Old Testament, and you believe that the Old Testament is authoritative, is the word of God, and it is accurate and true, then this really needs to be true because the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, is saying over and over again that the Messiah will be in the line of David. So Paul is writing to Jewish people who believe the Old Testament, and so he starts with, yes, Jesus is descended from David. Here are some of the verses. This is often read at Christmas, right? For unto us a child is born. This is a prophecy about Jesus when he's coming right? The, son, the, the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom. This is the point I want you to see. Isaiah is saying the Messiah is coming and he will sit on the throne of David. He will be in the line of David. Jeremiah does the same thing. He says, I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall, be, he shall reign as king. For the Jewish believers in the first century, this was mandatory. You, if Jesus was proven not to be in the line of David, then he could not be the Messiah. So Paul begins with, Jesus is in the line of of David. It's important for them. The second thing he says, and now we, we can prove Jesus is in the line of David, right? We'll get past Jeremiah. We can prove that Jesus is in the line of David by looking at the genealogies. It's really interesting. If you read through the Bible, if you've ever read through on the reading plan, you get to places like Numbers or some other places, and there are lists of names, and they're hard to pronounce, and you don't know who these people are. It's just, this person was the son of this person who was the son of this person, right? You wonder why those are here. Well, if you get to the New Testament, there's a couple of those in the Gospels, but it's the last genealogies of the Bible are in the New Testament, and they end with Jesus. There's no need for genealogies after that because we've gotten to the Messiah, and we needed the genealogies to prove that Jesus was the son of David. We needed those genealogies so that they could trace it back and demonstrate that Jesus was fulfilling the prophecies that the Messiah would come from the line of David. We don't need genealogies after that, so we don't have any more after that. 
but he's also the son of God. How can you prove, a genealogy is not going to prove that Jesus is the son of God. How do we prove that Jesus is the son of God also? If we look at Romans again, it says it right here, that he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection. It is by Jesus' resurrection from the dead that we know that he is the Son of God. That is our proof that he is God's Son because God's power was used to raise him from the dead. And so we know that Jesus is the Son of David and the Son of God. And these are the first two points that Paul wants us to know about Jesus right here in the beginning of his book to the Romans. So I want to get back to Paul. As he starts to write this letter, he's describing himself as a servant, as an apostle, and one who is set apart. And I want to talk about us for a minute. What is our identity? What is on your social media page? Literally, think about it. What have you posted on Facebook recently? What have you talked about? What are you always chatting about online? Because we know from statistics, people across the world are spending more and more time online. This is where we get to know people. This is where we interact with the world a lot of times. So who are we? How are we known? These are some of the questions I want us to think about this. Am I a slave to Christ? Now you might think, I'm not a slave to anybody. I don't want to be a slave. But I would would propose that perhaps we're all a slave to something. Maybe we're all working in our jobs really hard. We're a slave to our careers. Maybe it's money that we just need more money. Maybe we're just slaves to our free time, our our hobbies, whatever your hobby might be. Maybe you're a slave to food or drink or pleasure. I don't know what it is, but we're all working for, we're all striving for something, right? We're all enslaved to something or somebody. I want to think about, I want you to think about, want us all to think about, what are we enslaved to? What is driving our actions? What is the reason we get up in the morning and do what we do? There might not be somebody literally there with a whip enslaving you, telling you what to do, but there is something getting you out of bed in the morning, making you go to work, making you go to school, making you live the day. And that's what you're enslaved to. And if that's not Christ, I would challenge you to let Christ be the Lord of your life. Be enslaved to him because it is the most joyful, hopeful life you can live. So that's the first question for you to consider. Second question, am I a messenger of Christ? And what messages are we sharing? What do you talk about with people? This is a really practical question. What do you chat about online? When you get together with people and have food, what's the conversation about? Is it about movies and entertainment? Is it about kids and raising kids? Is it about work and what's happening at work? Those are all good things to chat about. But is that the only message you're sharing in your life? Do you ever talk about the gospel with your coworkers, with your family? Just something for you to think about. What messages are coming out of your life? And if we were to go and ask everybody you know, what is this person, what message does this person share with their life? What are they sharing online? What are they sharing in person? What messages are coming out of their life? What are your family going to say? What are your friends and coworkers and other students at school with you? What are they going to say your life is about? Is it about Christ? That's the question. That's the challenge today. And then the last question, Paul was set apart for a purpose. We are as well. How should you obey Christ? In Ephesians, it says this. It says, we are his workmanship. We Christians are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Christian, you are prepared for good works. The gospel is not to save us so we can stay the same. The gospel transforms us. Paul's life was turned completely upside down when he was on that road to Damascus. Everything changed for Paul. He was going to persecute and destroy the church. And then he became a builder of the church. His life was changed. How has the gospel changed your life? And what good works would God have you do? This is the challenge for us today. So 
just to give you the clear points. I want to make sure everybody can go away and talk about this in your small groups this week or talk about this over lunch. Who is Paul? He's a servant and apostle and set apart for the gospel. What is the gospel? It is a promise that Jesus is the Messiah. And who is Jesus? He is the son of David and the son of God who came to save sinners. These are all questions we need to be able to answer. These are foundational ideas for the Christian faith. So as you go today, just take these and remember them and be able to say these really simple definitions. Be able to share these with others and then be able to answer these questions. Are you a slave to Christ? Are you a messenger of Christ? And how do you need to obey Christ? It's, it's an easy message and yet hard to do, right? And if you, I'll just challenge, leave it with this. If you don't yet follow Christ, if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, you've not yet surrendered your life to Christ, I would just challenge you to consider Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We are all enslaved to something, like I said earlier. If you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life and, and say, Jesus, set me free from these other slaveries. Set me free from lust. Set me free from greed. Set me free from these other things that enslave me. Let me be a slave to you. He will come and rescue you. He will be your savior and you can follow him. If you need to talk to somebody about that this morning, please find one of your pastors here at the church and have that conversation. Please ask them, how is it that I can follow Christ with my life? Because I want to be free from these other things that enslave me, the sins that entangle me. I'm going to pray for us, and we are going to be done this morning, and you guys can wrestle with this in your small groups together. Jesus, we love you. We thank you and praise you that you are the son of David and the son of God who fulfilled the prophecies in the Old Testament, that you came to set us free from sin and death and give us new life with you. We worship you this morning for that new life, and we praise you for the opportunity to be messengers of yours in the world. And I pray this week you would give us very clear, very easy to obey opportunities to proclaim you in the world. I pray that our social media, our lives would reflect Jesus in the world. Help us to do that more and more. Show us what works of obedience you have for us this week and help us walk in those faithfully as we follow you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.